there? Hold on. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Um, you're very welcome. My name is Mark Little. Um, I will be your host for the next hour as we take a journey through the ever-expanding universe of the Google News Initiative and as I introduce in a moment to the director of Google News Labs, Olivia Ma. Um, I don't think there's a person in the audience or anybody in the news business who hasn't been touched directly, indirectly in some way by what Google News Initiative is doing. Probably fair to say there's not a person who also is not challenged to keep up with the kind of daily unfolding new initiatives across the globe, the work that Olivia's team are doing. Now, I know a lot of the focus uh, because of our existential crisis uh, in our business model has been on funding for innovation, has been on the work that Google have been doing to support a shift toward reader revenue. But this is a great moment to take a look, I think, as well, at that sort of role uh, that Google plays in this sort of tsunami of, of technology and journalism that has created so many challenges for the news business, but so many opportunities to kind of leverage technology to serve the communities that we work for. I also think there's obviously big questions uh, for us as journalists as we become closer and closer to a technology company about our ability to speak truth back to power. And that's obviously something that we can talk about a little later when we have our Q&A session. Very briefly, the reason I'm here, first of all, um, I did actually speak in this hall for a technology company, in my case, Twitter, a couple of years ago. So I'm kind of here to give some moral support. It can be a tough crowd, but if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. Um, I'm also somebody who, uh, my new company, Kinzen, has been supported by the Digital News Initiative, and that has been a critical part of the early successes for the company that myself and my colleague, Anya Kerr, lead. Um, but most of all, it's because of Olivia, who I consider to be one of those kind of unsung pioneers in some of the most important things that have happened for journalism in an age of information overload. I first met Olivia 10 years ago. Um, it was in 2010. I was trying to persuade what I thought was the Silicon Valley executive that you know, YouTube at the time she worked for should have the help of journalists processing the tsunami of eyewitness video coming through on YouTube. A few weeks after that, a fruit seller called Mohamed Bouazizi lit himself on fire in a town called Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia which was literally the spark for the Arab Spring. In the weeks and months that followed, literally every Friday, hundreds of videos would flow through YouTube from Tunisia, from places like Cairo, from Syria. And Olivia was one of the first people within YouTube to go to the mat to really bat for the resources and support for organizations like the one I work for, Storyful, but an emerging coalition of people who were doing what we now think of as fact-checking, was verification, validation, of this searingly honest and authentic testimony that was coming through YouTube. And over the years, again and again, I know, probably with a lot of argument inside YouTube and then Google and Google Plus, which she also worked for, kept coming back with that support. And what I realized over the years was this is not a Silicon Valley executive. This is someone who's steeped deeply through her own family in the values of journalism and its transition into a digital age. So, with that, and with the reminder that while we talk about platforms, publishers, this moment is also about people within these organizations. And one of those people, I think, is a remarkable pioneer. Please welcome Olivia Ma. Thank you, Mark. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Olivia. It's so wonderful to be here. I actually spent a summer um, in college here in Perugia studying Italian, and it's, I haven't been back here since I was 19 years old, and so it's so wonderful to be able to walk these beautiful streets again. My Italian is very bad, so apologies, but um, it really has kind of been a bit on my bucket list to come to this, this journalism festival and come back to this, this beautiful city. Um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about myself and why I'm here. Um, in addition to being the director of the, of the Google News Lab, which we'll talk about in a minute, I'm also the daughter of, of a newspaper man. Um, this is my dad and me when I was a little baby. Uh, and my dad spent his career as a journalist. Um, he worked at news organizations like Newsweek, US News and World Report, and the Washington Post. And as a kid, I would take my class every year and go visit him in the newsroom. And we would learn all about what it took to actually produce a, a news magazine and a newspaper the old-fashioned way with, with ink and with paper. Um, and uh, growing up, uh, my family was always discussing and debating what was happening in the world. We would sit around our kitchen table and really talk about the news of the day and why it mattered. 
Um, and because my dad was a journalist and my mom was a lawyer, the values of objectivity and truth were central to our family. And we were always discussing and debating things and really trying to look at things from all sides. Um, my family never shied away from a good debate. And even if we, things got heated, we always came out better informed and really valued being able to see things from multiple points of view. Um, it wasn't until college, though, that I myself caught the journalism bug, even though I was surrounded and steeped in journalism and news um, as a child. Um, and it was that time that I decided I wanted to dedicate my career to thinking about the future of news. Uh, by that time, my dad had started working at the Washington Post, and he was actually WashingtonPost.com's first editor. So he was responsible for thinking about how to bring the Post online and transition it to a digital, digital future. Um, up until he passed away in 2011, we would have these really long, in-depth conversations about what, what news was going to look like in, a, in, in the age of technology. Um, and it was so meaningful to me, and I miss having those conversations with him. But I'm incredibly grateful uh, and really honored to get a chance to kind of continue his legacy, albeit from a really different vantage point. Um, so I joined Google 11 years ago. Um, it was only a year into my time uh, as YouTube's very first news manager that I had the chance to meet Mark and get to work with Storyful. Um, and ever since then, I've had the opportunity to, to get to work with many of you in the room, journalists, publishers, entrepreneurs, and students, to think about how technology can help build a stronger future for journalism. Um, this is a, a screenshot of the welcome video that you had to make when you joined YouTube as an employee which was incredibly embarrassing and taught me never to read the YouTube comments um, for a video of yourself. Uh, almost five years ago, we decided to create the Google News Lab. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the News Lab, we're a global team comprised of a lot of journalists, former journalists, news junkies, people really, really passionate about news who are specifically dedicated to going into newsrooms and helping and working with journalists to think about how to fully take advantage of technology inside the newsroom. Um, but the News Lab is just one team uh, at Google, and we are dedicated to innovation in the newsroom. But we're part of this broader initiative, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, called the Google News Initiative, which is the company's umbrella effort to bring everything that we're doing to collaborate with the news industry under one, one effort, called, which we call the GNI. So today I want to share a little bit of a progress report on the GNI, where we are one year in. Um, but before I go any further, I, I do want to just say a couple things about, first of all, thank you uh, for being here today. I think forums like this are so crucial for us to be able to have a really open dialogue with the industry, with our partners, to really understand how we can best collaborate with you. And so that's not lip service. I truly mean it. We're honored to be here and to have the opportunity to stand here and tell you about the work that we're doing. But more importantly, we, this is a dialogue and a conversation. And so I look forward to hearing your, your feedback and questions um, after, after the, the presentation. Um, and secondly, we want to talk a little bit about why news matters to us as a company. Um, it starts very basically with our mission. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful. Um, our missions, we feel, are very aligned with the mission of newsrooms and journalists. We deeply, deeply care about journalism because we believe that a rich and healthy news ecosystem is good for our users, it's good for publishers, and it's good for society writ large. But if you're skeptical about how deep that commitment is, um, I also want to share two really clear business reasons, uh, incentives, wh why we care about news and why we think our relationship is unique. Um, a great search engine, it, by its very nature, depends on the open web and on open access to high quality information. People come to Google when they have questions and when they're seeking answers. And it's our responsibility to give them trusted, authoritative information in those moments, especially when it comes to answering questions about what's happening right now, when people are looking for information to make informed decisions about their life. We want to help surface your high-quality journalism and connect those users who are seeking information to your journalism. And so that's another reason it, our products are better because of the work that you do. And finally, um, our business incentives are aligned. 
the way that our, some of our biggest and most important businesses, like, for example, Google Ad Manager, which is formerly known as DoubleClick, is, a, is set up as a revenue share model. So last year, we actually paid $14 billion to publishers in the news industry, um, up from $12.7 billion in, in the year prior, uh, and drove more than 10 billion clicks to publishers each month for free. So it's a revenue share, and we really are set up so that we don't grow unless you're also growing and becoming successful. YouTube, as well as Google Play, have similar dynamics with revenue shares. And so we're very invested in content creators growing and being successful alongside us. So between our mission, our products, and our business model, we really feel like our, our futures are inextricably linked. So that said, we recognize that we're in a really uniquely challenging time for journalism. Um, and there's a lot of big challenges that, that we face alongside you. Um, the first is that the magic of the internet is it created a printing press for each individual person, which has been amazing when you think about democratizing the web and bringing new voices to the fore that might not otherwise have been heard. But obviously, there's challenges that come with that too. And it's harder to know now what to trust and what information is accurate. And we have a responsibility to try and help people find trusted, authoritative information, especially in those moments that matter most, like elections or breaking news situations. And we know we need to get it right. The second is that we rec um, excuse me. The second is that journalism's economic models are changing. I don't need to tell you all that. Um, Print advertising you know, is, is in many places in decline. The digital advertising hasn't necessarily caught up everywhere. At the same time, we know that there's an increasing willingness to pay for content in many markets um, for news online. So the models are shifting. And then third, the, the rapid pace of technological change is challenging every institution in every industry, not just journalism, even technology itself. And a majority of adults in, in developed markets are getting their, their news on social media. In, in developing markets, it's chat apps. There are new technologies like voice-activated devices that are fundamentally changing how people consume news. Amidst all of this, you have things like AI and machine learning that are presenting huge opportunities and challenges for news organizations. So navigating all of this requires us working more deeply together than we ever have before. And it led us to a really simple realization, which is that we need to be doing more. So many of you here in Europe are familiar with the Digital News Initiative, which is the program we started in 2015 um, that supports innovation in news here in Europe. And we wanted to build on the success and the model of the DNI, but on a global scale. So that's why we created the Google News Initiative. Again, it's our global effort to help journalism thrive um, in the digital age. And to help us address these challenges, we've organized our work along three main pillars. We call, we call them the three E's. But first, we're focusing on evolving business models to find new paths towards financial sustainability. Second, we're committed to elevating quality journalism to Google users and users everywhere across the web. And finally, we're working to empower journalists and newsrooms with new technology, whether it's tools for journalists or new audio and video formats. So far, we've committed a total of $120 million of the $300 million um, that we have for the Google News Initiative. Um, and these, this funding is going towards efforts that we believe will accelerate our progress in those three areas. And to date, we've funded more than 350 organizations in 70 countries around the world. So I want to start by talking about evolving business models, our, our first pillar. Um, we've heard loud and clear from many of you that while digital advertising continues to be a very, very important part of your business model, you're increasingly looking at new forms of monetization, especially subscriptions and other forms of reader revenue. In fact, the Reuters Institute asked news executives as part of their annual survey which digital rev revenue stream was most important to them in 2019. And more than half of these executives said that subscriptions would be their primary revenue focus this year. So we see that these models are evolving. And fortunately, we're seeing really promising signs of success. Um, obviously, you, you have on the global scale, you have someone like the New York Times that's already su surpassed their print readership um, subscribers base with 4 million digital subscriptions. But you also have someone like the Hindu in India that's celebrating 100,000 paid subscribers um, to their e-paper edition. 
Closer to home, here in Italy, we have a number of top newspapers that are showing strong subscription growth in a market that doesn't traditionally have a, a, a historical behavior of, of subscribing. Last spring, after consulting with many, many publishers um, around the world to understand their needs and help us define the product requirements, we launched Subscribe with Google. Subscribe with Google is a seamless sign-in and payment flow that allows users to use their Google account to subscribe to news publications across the web. This eliminates the need for new account creation, memorizing new passwords, or entering the details of, of credit cards. These things can cause a lot of friction in the process, and the idea is how can we streamline that process so that it's as easy as possible for a user to subscribe when they've decided to do that. The amazing thing is that once we know that you're a subscriber, we'll give you access to your content no matter what device you're on, no matter what surface you're on. So we're providing access, and um, you're, you'll stay signed in no matter where you are, and we will honor that subscription across Google surfaces. We're still relatively early in the journey, um, but to date we've signed 48 partners across 19 countries to subscribe with Google, and we have 15 partners who have already launched their full integration, including here in Italy, um, Il Fatto Quotidiano and La Repubblica, uh, Tagerspiel in Germany and the FT in London, just to give you a, a sense of, of a few of our, our partners. And while we can't share data from specific publishers or individual publishers at this point, we can say that our early results show that conversion rates for subscribe with Google are notably higher, more than 20%, and engagement rates for those users are, are also higher than the average. So we're really encouraged by the progress, although it is very, very early days. The business relationship has also been very carefully structured to maximize the revenue back to you, back to our publishing partners, with revenue shares of 95% on your website and 85% on your Android apps. Google's share of that is, is really just to cover the costs of running the business. Um, also, very importantly, we recognize that these are your relationships with your users. So we don't want to just give you a nameless ID. Um, we are actually going to give you the contact information and the subscriber's email address so that you can really own that relationship with your subscriber. We also know that this is not a trivial technology to implement on your site. So we're trying to make it easier to implement the Subscribe with Google, starting with a partnership with Piano, which is a third-party paywall technology provider, to help make that process a little bit easier for our publishers. We also know there are other re reader revenue models that can benefit from the Subscribe with Google functionality. So just last week, we announced support for contributions and membership models uh, inside of Subscribe with Google. So more publishers can get the same benefits of streamlined registration process and payments sign in across devices. Um, contributions functionality will be available in Subscribe with Google in the next few months. And we're very excited that The Guardian, which has independently built a very successful contributions model, uh, with a, more than a million uh, paying supporters now is signed on to be our alpha tester in this, this new, um, new tech. Last year, we also announced Propensity to Subscribe, which is a signal that uses machine learning to help you determine which of your users is most likely to pay for content and which maybe aren't. So for example, imagine a user that, that comes to the site maybe once a month and reads an article and then leaves. That person may not be as as a sort of likely to subscribe, and maybe you'll show them an ad. Whereas you have another user that comes to your site a couple times a week, and maybe they read an article or two before leaving. They're maybe a more likely candidate, and you might be able to target them with a customized, targeted discount offer. We're currently in closed beta with 11 partners, and including the Washington Post and McClatchy, who are actively experimenting with the signal. It will be an ongoing learning, a learning journey, and we're iterating in its early days, but we're really encouraged by what we're seeing so far. For instance, when looking across some of our, our beta partners, the propensity model shows that readers in the top 20% of likely subscribers are 50 times more likely to subscribe than readers in the bottom 20%. Within the next few months, propensity to subscribe will be integrated within the Subscribe with Google platform. Products are just one piece of the puzzle, though. And we know that developing a successful reader revenue model takes time, it's resource intensive, and it takes a lot of creativity and thought. And so I'll just end this section by saying we, we are in this together, and we are very committed to deeply partnering with 
our publishing partners to develop those best practices, which we don't know what those are yet. It's too soon to say, but we're committed to working on, alongside you to figure out what works and what doesn't, and then really importantly, help to share those learnings across the industry from region to region so that we can lift the industry up as a whole. Okay, our next pillar is elevating quality journalism. Um, at its core, news plays a crucial role in society by helping citizens really reach informed conclusions about the issues of the day. We're taking a three-pronged approach when it comes to elevating quality journalism. The first is we work directly with partners in the industry to figure out ways to combat mis mis and disinformation and elevate quality journalism. The second is to build products that help surface trusted information. And third is to develop and provide new programs to help provide media literacy skills for consumers. So we all know that giving people access to trusted information in those critical moments is very, very important. And that's why we've decided to focus on deeply engaging with our ecosystem partners ahead of key elections. Um, our work in the space, and this is, this is an area that News Lab has been really deeply involved in, our work in the space actually began back in 2016 for the US election, um, when we helped create a collaborative reporting project called Election Land, which was the biggest project of its kind to date. We worked with more than 1,000 journalists across 300 newsrooms across the US uh, to track problems at the polls on election day. At this point, mis misinformation was not necessarily on everyone's radar, and so that wasn't necessarily the focus of this project, but it gave us a model for what does it look like to actually have news organizations partner together, people that otherwise would never work together. The next election um, after the US election was in the spring of, of 2017, and it was the election in France. Um, and by then, we had a broader awareness of these challenges around misinformation and the bad actors that were purposefully spreading it. So Crosscheck was a partnership with our longtime partner, First Draft, and brought together 37 newsrooms to collectively and collaboratively debunk misinformation and hoaxes ahead of the French election. Building on the success in France, we actually launched similar partnerships in the UK with Full Fact and with Correctiv in Germany that same year. Just want to pause for a moment on, on Comprova, which is the uh, initiative we did in Brazil uh, just most recently in October. Um, this was the largest journalism collaboration that's ever been done in Brazil with 24 news organizations um, across TV, radio, uh, digital natives, print, including historic rivals that never in a million years would have worked together. But the coming together for the collective common good of citizens ahead of a crucial election broke down all those barriers. And people were willing to collaborate and work together because they knew that we would be better off if news organizations were working together to, col to collaboratively fact check and verify misinformation instead of competing with each other. It wasn't a good use of resources. And these are, this is a pretty revolutionary thing. Um, the other amazing thing about Comprova is that they actually reached 20 million Brazilians through their various media channels. All of those 24 partners were then broadcasting out that, that those debunked hoaxes and misinformation to their respective audiences. And so the, the impact was massive. And many, many people were able to receive higher quality information about the election as a result of this partnership. The other really cool thing about this is that they actually opened up a WhatsApp channel uh, for Brazilians to communicate with the journalists in the newsroom to ask them questions and say, hey, I saw this on social media and I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's true. And in the 10-week period of this project before the election, they were getting three messages every two minutes. So you can see that the demand from, from their readers, from their audiences, was huge. And the fact that they had news organizations working together actually increased the trust in the information that those, those journalists were producing. So really excited to see this. Um, and ahead of the EU elections um, this spring, we're now preparing by providing digital verification training in 27 EU countries. We're working again with our partner First Draft to do boot camps in Madrid, Milan, Frankfurt, and Brussels. And similar to these other collaborative efforts, we've helped to launch Fact Check EU, um, a collaboration with 19 organizations from 13 countries to fact check ahead of the elections. So we kind of found a really cool model here working with many organizations um, that we're excited to bring to more countries ahead of their elections. 
We're also working with the broader information ecosystem to address misinformation, again, both on our platforms as well as more broadly. Over the last few years, Google has invested heavily in fact-checking efforts. Um, we actually launched our first fact-check tag in October of 2016. Um, and since then, we've built a number of tools and worked to really enable an independent ecosystem of, of fact-check organizations, um, including a partnership with the International Fact-Checking Network to help grow the number of fact-checkers globally through training, tools, and resources. Um, now we're building on that work with the launch of two key tools that are really specifically designed for newsrooms and journalists. The first is the fact check markup tool. It's a little bit technical, but it helps make it easier for you to mark up your fact checking content using the open standard claim review. If you have no idea what that means, it basically means we're making it really simple to add the code to your page that tells Google and other platforms that are using the open standard, this is a fact check. And that allows us to ingest that properly so that we can surface it on places like search and Google News when a user is encountering sort of memes or, or information that, where a fact check could be useful. The second tool that we've just uh, released last week is called the Fact Check Explorer, which is specifically de designed for journalists. And this um, helps you find existing fact checks on topics of interest. Uh, which is a really useful research tool we've heard and something we developed in partnership and collaboration with a lot of fact-checking organizations. We're also opening up APIs so that developers can actually build their own tools on top of this to assist fact-checkers even more around the world. The last... The slides are not going, but the notes are going. Okay, while well, that's catching up, um, the last several years have presented many challenges, obviously, um, and we really continue to be vigilant about our approach, but we know it's not enough to just say, trust us, we know what we're doing. Um, we know that we need to show our work and be transparent about the methods that we use and really clear about the principles that guide our work. Um, last month, let's see if it works now. Nope. There we go, great, thank you. Last month we released um, a white paper um, on how we address m misinformation across, across Google as a part of our effort to sort of increase transparency about our efforts. Um, and that commitment to transparency extends across all of Google's products, not just in the context of misinformation. So to give publishers and individuals a deeper sense of how our news products work, we are about to launch a site called How News Works. Um, very straightforward, but we'll, we'll actually walk you through how our different news services work, everything from search to Google News to Discover, um, and how and why we choose what news to show there. Um, the goal is to answer the most important questions that you have about how your content is showing up and surfacing across Google. While we can work to debunk, uh, debunk stories, with, you know, work with partners to debunk stories and surface high quality information on our products, we know that it's equally important to ensure that individuals have the tools they need to decipher fact from fiction. Um, and so this really speaks to the importance of media literacy at all levels of our society, whether it's a teenager learning how to research, do a research paper on, on the internet, to you know, my mom who's trying to evaluate a link that she might have seen on social media. You know, people across every aspect level of our society need to have the skills to discern what's, what's accurate and what's not. Um, so spurred by a $10 million grant from Google.org that we announced last year, um, we're starting to partner with NGOs, academic institutions, and newsrooms around the world to create uh, digital literacy programs that are tailored and customized specifically to the region. So we're doing this everywhere from Portugal to Brazil to the UK to Thailand. I want to just highlight one specific project um, in the UK, which is a group called Student View. Um, and Student View is actually providing 50 schools in less privileged neighborhoods in the UK with what's, what's called a news day, which um, brings secondary school students to actually report on the stories that matter to them and to their communities. And at the same time, they're also learning how to think critically about sources of material and really decipher sort of what's accurate from what isn't. So it's a really cool program, and we're excited to support more of these things around the world. So our last pillar is empowering newsrooms with technology. Um, this is the area that News Lab has been invested in since 2015, since we started. 
And we really believe that there is reason to be very optimistic about how technology can, can empower journalists. Um, technological in innovation is unleashing unprecedented creativity inside of newsrooms, new forms of storytelling, and elevating new voices that otherwise wouldn't be heard. Um, now I want to show a video from our partner in India that's using technology in a really powerful way. बुंदेलखंड का जो बांदा और चित्रकूट है यहाँ पे बहुत ही जनिस कम है लेकिन उनमें से एक ऐसा मंच है जो खबर लहरिया अखबार है जिसमें महिला रिपोर्टर है उनमें से मैं हूँ एक मेरा नाम गीता है भारत है वो कृषि प्रधान देश है जहाँ पे 80 परसेंट किसान रहते हैं ज्यादातर खासकर बुंदेलखंड में इस समय बहुत ज्यादा किसानों की बदहाली चल रही है जिसको लेकर किसान आए दिन कहीं धरना कहीं आंदोलन कहीं कुछ ना कुछ करते रहते हैं अपनी मांगों के लिए हम लोग ये कहते हैं कि सरकार पूरे बुंदेलखंड क्षेत्र को पूरा करे धरने में उस गांव के किसान थे नौगांव गांव के वो आए कहते हैं मैडम हमारे गांव में पानी की बहुत ज्यादा समस्या है इस बारी बहुत सारी खेती पड़ी हुई है बोई नहीं गई है तो लहर के खबर करने का जो हमारा रीजन था पहला तो किसानों की फसल बुआई का समय था बारिश भी नहीं हो रही थी किसान अपने आप में परेशान थे और वो नहर भी सरकार नहीं चालू कर रही थी क्योंकि नहर चालू होने का भी समय था इस तरह की खबर करने के लिए अन्य मीडिया वहाँ तक नहीं पहुँचती है जो कि केवल खबर लहरिया उन इलाकों में जा करके लोगों से बातचीत करके ही खबरों को कवर करती है आज मैं नरैनी ब्लॉक के नौगावा गांव में मान यहाँ के लोगों का कहना है कि यहाँ लगभग 20 साल पहले उस समय नहर खुदवाई गई थी लेकिन आज तक नहर में पानी नहीं आया जो स्टाइल ऑफ रिपोर्टिंग है जो मुझे लगता है कि अभी मेन स्ट्रीम मीडिया में खत्म हो रहा है कि आपके एक्चुअली ऑन ग्राउंड रिपोर्टर्स हैं जो जो रिपोर्टिंग कर रहे हैं जो डेस्क पर बैठ कर के अपने ओपिनियंस नहीं लिख रहे हैं क्या इस स्थिति है खेतों की क्यों ऐसे बैठे हैं पानी नहीं आया शायद तब भी ना पानी के बाई नहीं जाएगा तो सोचे क्या टेक्नोलॉजी है उसकी पहुँच बढ़ी है आज हम दिल्ली में बैठे हैं और हम जो कर रहे हैं काम वो उन क्षेत्रों तक पहुँच पा रहा है तब जब वो फिर से पब्लिश हुई और जब अधिकारी पक्ष तक वो खबर पहुँची है उसके बाद उनमें असर हुआ और उन नहरों में फिर से पानी छोड़ा गया था हमारी नहर बहुत पुरानी हो चुकी है जगह जगह टूटी टूटी है इसलिए पानी पहुँचने में दिक्कत होती है भूकाम करा दिया गया था पानी पहुँच गया है तो वो मुझे भी सुन के बहुत अच्छा लगा था ये किसान जो उस समय मुरझाए हुए थे तो आज इनके चेहरे थोड़ी खिले हुए हैं कहते हैं एवरीडे स्टोरीज ऑफ एवरीडे पीपल इन खबर लहरिया दैट्स न्यूज न्यूज इज नॉट जस्ट वॉट इज ऑन द हेडलाइंस ऑफ बिग न्यूज पीपल्स और आ हैंड पम्प विच इज ब्रोकन इन अ विलेज विच इज 50 किलोमीटर्स अवे फ्रॉम द डिस्ट्रिक्ट हेड क्वार्टर्स वो भी न्यूज है और वो इतना ही जरूरी न्यूज है जर्नलिस्ट कोई ऐसी वो नहीं है जहाँ पे क्योंकि बहुत से लोग कहते हैं कि अरे ये तो महिलाओं का क्षेत्र ही है ही नहीं लेकिन हम क्यों कह रहे हैं कि नहीं है महिलाओं का क्षेत्र महिला कुछ भी कर सकती है क्या किसी पुरुष से कम है महिला
So Kabar Lahari is a great example of an organization that's really taking advantage of technology and doing incredible journalism. And we're really proud that they're one of our training partners in India. Um, training efforts are actually one of the, our biggest efforts at the News Lab. Um, we train newsrooms on everything from how to use Google Earth to do you know, a visualization of a story to how to begin to approach artificial intelligence. Um, and since we started in 2015, we've actually trained 150,000 journalists in person. Um, and that number actually crosses 500,000 uh, when you include our online, um, our online courses and digital platform. Um, and we've been working on the ground here since 2015, here in Europe. Um, we have an established team based in London, Paris, and Berlin who work on some of our bigger projects that I talked about before. We also have teaching fellows who provide free training based in Spain and Portugal, Italy, Poland, Central and Eastern Europe, um, the UK and the Nordics. Um, we're also hiring in Africa and the Middle East, if you, if you know anybody. Um, we also work with organizations across Europe. In Germany, we're working with Network Media Trainer to provide digital skills to newsrooms across the country. In Central and Eastern Europe, we're supporting Outriders to host collaborative reporting events, and the Center for Investigative Journalism in the UK to also provide 20 workshops for journalists across the UK. And this year, for the fourth year, we're running a series of events with the European Journalism Center um, to provide journalism summits as well as smaller academy training academies to help bring journalists and technologists together. A really big thank you to all of our partners, particularly here in Europe. You were really, in many ways, where the News Lab got its start, um, and we're really, we love working with all of you. Um, in addition to training and finding the best use for existing tools, we're also heavily invested in building new products. Um, for journalists and, and publishers. And this has really been true, particularly in the last three or four years. When we work on new news products at Google now, we now lean heavily on your expertise and your, your, uh, your input. Um, we need your input to build the right products, and we've learned that it has to be a collaboration. Um, this actually started really here in Europe with the DNI, and the DNI started these product working groups, and really important innovations and technology came out of that, like AMP the Accelerated Mobile Pages project, as well as the YouTube player for publishers. Those products were born out of conversations that publishers were having directly with our product executives and our engineering leads, in th that, which had never happened before. Um, and now we're starting to use that same model every single time we want to develop a new product for news. And so we've done that with Subscribe with Google, and now with our audio, um, our audio efforts as well. We're bringing people into our discussions to make sure that we're building the right products that will work for you. But we know that innovation comes from a lot of places, and we don't expect that it's all going to come from Google. Um, many of the best ideas actually are going to come from you. And so we've, uh, we've really wanted to build on what we've done with the DNI fund here in Europe um, and, do, uh, and launch a series of what we are calling the GNI Innovation Challenges. Um, we know that every region has its own nuances, so we're doing this in a really local, tailored approach based on a region. Um, in November, we actually launched the first GNI challenge in the Asia Pacific region with a focus on new reader revenue models. Um, we asked publishers across the region to share their ideas on new business models, and we're, we've just last week awarded funding to 23 projects from 14 countries, which we're really excited about. But we're also pleased to announce that we're going to launch the innovation challenges. Uh, across the world um, in, in four additional regions in the coming year in Europe, Africa, Middle East, North America, as well as Latin America. So more to come on that soon, but we're really excited about expanding this and really seeing what, what you all can, can produce and provide. I um, just want to wrap by saying that the news industry is, is at this inflection point, um, and there is so much to be optimistic about when it comes to journalism in the digital age. We do not have all the answers obviously. Nobody does, but we're committed to really partnering and working directly with you to figure it out together. And we believe that it is a partnership and a collaboration that's going to, to make this work. We're committed to doing our part and doing it passionately, um, but we always welcome your thoughts, ideas, feedback, suggestions, and so I'm looking forward to, to hearing your questions now um, and talking with you afterwards. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. You've been busy for the last 11 years, right? Um, and we want to get your thoughts, your questions in a moment. Um, first thing does strike me, just given the scale of the work that's done, you know, it used to be in many ways news was the marketing 
departments function, right? This is obviously well entrenched in product, etc. There are the skeptics in the news business say, listen, we know how important our, you know, Google has become to our business, but we wonder how important news is to Google. So we know the work of your team and the partnerships team, but how deep lasting is the commitment of Google to news and how far up the, the leadership does it, does it go? Well, our, we happen to have a CEO who is a complete news junkie. So aside from our business commitment and all the reasons why I said Google cares, Sundar, our, our CEO, is obsessed with news. And so on a personal level, uh, the commitment comes from a very, very high, high up um, in, in the chain. But I think, you know, Google, this is not new for us. Of course, the, the Google News Initiative is one year old, but it's really important to emphasize that that is in many ways the culmination or, or the evolution of 17 years worth of work. Um, 17 years ago is when we launched Google News, and that was the first sort of initiative that we did in the news space, but it spoke to sort of how news was an extension of Google's core mission. Um, if you think about search as trying to organize the world's information, Google News was trying to organize the world's news. Um, and since then, you know, there's just been continued investment um, that has really accelerated and increased over time. So, you know, as I said in my, in my you know, early on in my talk, we have a mission-driven reason, our, our, we have a product-driven reason, and we have business model reasons that all suggest like this commitment is deep, lasting, and fundamental to Google and what we are. So this is, this is not a passing fad, if you will. And I suppose that creates this other danger that, you know, journalists then suddenly feel, well, you know, the alignment in terms of scale is not there. Like, Google is so big. Mm -hmm. The more and closer we get to Google, the more we get absorbed into this tech, tech organization. Yes, I mean, we do hear sometimes people saying, you know, we don't want to become dependent on you. And we completely agree. Um, I think that everything that we're doing in the news industry now, and this is particularly true, I think, now that we've brought everything under the Google News Initiative, is about experimentation to identify sustainable models that can be scaled. And we have no interest in just, you know, giving people uh, sort of funding to go ex experiment, but then hold, hold that for themselves. Everything that we're doing is trying to sort of open source the learnings with the goal of, of rise, you know, the rising tide should lift all boats. Um, and so we're laser focused now on saying, okay, yes, we're gonna, ex we're gonna work with you to experiment. We may, you know, provide funding for an experiment, uh, but the goal is financial sustainability and models that will stand the test of time. Um, and a really big focus, actually, of our team is how do we take the learnings from, you know, what's a success story that's happening in, in Asia that could actually be really relevant for a publisher in Europe that, or, maybe, or, or maybe a publisher in Latin America, and actually connecting those dots. And that's something that we feel like we're uniquely positioned to do, and we're really excited about the possibility of saying, you all should check out what they're doing in Canada, because it's incredible, and it could actually work here in Italy. Use the phrase unique positioning, and I know that most technology companies hate being lumped together, right? <laughs> what distinguishes your approach from other technology organizations? How do you think yourselves uniquely positioned? Yeah, I, I think that, um, Part of it is that we have been doing this for a long time. Um, again, even though the GNI is is relatively new, uh, the the sustained commitment, the investment in news is a, a, a decade plus um, long. So, in that sense, um, we're not reacting to things that maybe have happened in the news in the last couple of years. We're really doubling down on a commitment that has been really foundational for the company, really for almost, almost since its, its beginning. Um, and I think the fact that our, our business incentives and mission are aligned means that we're, we're truly invested in your success because our success is linked to yours. And, you know, I don't want to speak about any particular other company, but I don't know that that is as true for some of the other technology platforms. And um, our, our interest is, is genuine and, and, uh, and deep, um, and we feel that it's fundamental to 
Google as well as our mission and our and society br more broadly that journalism succeed. Before I just get some questions, one final question about alignment, which I think a lot of the people who've been fighting misinformation, I mean, give massive kudos to you guys for what you've done. But at the same time, they also see the algorithm in the background on a platform like YouTube recommending mm -hmm. a lot of the misinformation that we're fighting against on the other side of the house. How, how does that get resolved? Uh, the yeah. algorithms seem to be in this black box and we don't know how to get at them and stop them ranking emotion, not quality. Yes. The YouTube team has made huge investments over the last two years to really address some of these issues. Um, and it's, they, it's been taken extremely seriously and it's, it's a top priority for, for the leadership there. Um, there's a number of changes that have been made. Um, first is really around how we treat news content on YouTube. And as somebody who was early days at YouTube, it's been, it's been great to see some of these changes made, um, particularly in breaking news situations, right, where we know that it takes time for journalists to do their work. It takes time to do the fact, you know, the, 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 the news gathering, to produce the video. And in that gap between when the event happens and when journalists can actually produce high quality video, there is a, a time gap there where sometimes bad actors can, can flood the zone, if you will. Um, and so YouTube has taken some really important steps of, first of all, in, when those breaking news situations happen, ensuring that we're boosting authoritative quality sources, news sources that are, that are vet, vetted and trusted, um, not just defaulting to the most recently uploaded videos. Um, also, when there's an emerging story and there's, we don't have good video to show, we're actually now showing snippets from um, news articles, from publishers' uh, articles, within YouTube. So it's actually not a video, right? If we don't have a good video to show, we're not going to show a bad video. Um, and that's being pulled from Google News. Um, we're also providing context um, around issues that are particularly prone to misinformation, conspiracy theories, um, hoaxes, uh, and drawing that from third parties. This is, I think, has a, sort of an experimental phase in the U.S. right now with the plans to roll it out globally, but pulling in third-party sources like Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia to sort of say, okay, you know what, the moon landing is actually real and we're going to link to this source that is going to show that. So that's kind of on the news front. I think on the, the point about the algorithms, um, we announced a really important change in January of this year, which is that for controversial content, um, so this is content that is close to the line, right? Where, you know, YouTube is, we believe strongly in, the, in being a platform for free speech. There are videos that don't necessarily cross um, th that, those terms of service and, and that, that, those policy lines, but they're also probably not videos that we should be recommending. And so we've made a change to the recommendation system on YouTube, which is a very powerful engine, to remove those videos from our recommendations list. So they will still exist on YouTube, they can still be found technically, but they're not being recommended anymore. And that's a really, really important change that we hope to address some of these, some of these issues. So some questions, the audience. I'm sure you have this gentleman right here in the fifth row. We've got a microphone on its way to you. Hi, I, I set up the first internet radio in the Arab world in the year 2000, Amanet. And Google, FA, uh, Google and YouTube has been a great blessing for us to bypass dictatorships and so on. But it's becoming difficult to sustain our work. And mm. the subscription models and others that you spoke about seem to be kind of tailor-made for the New York Times and the big... But is there something that would fit a more a smaller organization or, or in countries like ours where there is a little bit of window of opportunity, but we need to really keep it uh, open. Yes. Um, no, I'm glad you raised that. I think we are very interested. I didn't talk about local uh, in, you know, and smaller publishers as much in this, in this presentation, but it's a really big focus for us at the Google News Initiative is supporting local news organizations. Um, I think with Subscribe with Google, um, not, subscription model is not necessarily going to work for everybody, and we, we recognize that. So we're not, certainly not pushing everyone to try and adopt that model. Um, but we are uh, really interested in thinking about some of these contribution models, where it's, a, it's not necessarily a long-term commitment, but, but you could, um, you know, 
someone could contribute if they felt moved by a particular story or they wanted to support your organization. And we feel like contributions in some ways could potentially be a little bit of a lower barrier to entry. I think importantly, we're also trying to make it easier for smaller organizations to implement this technology. Right now, it takes, it takes some engineering work to implement this. And we know that not everybody is capable or has the resources to do that. So a big focus for this year is actually making these tools much easier, much more plug and play, where it does not require a, a tech team to do it, so that any publisher could actually build this into, into their site. So happy to chat more afterwards, though. Yeah. Any more questions there? I'm blind about light a bit. but. Uh... Yes, this gentleman here in the middle. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm a young journalist at Deutsche Welle. And um, I just wanted to ask, you know, you have a... What are the challenges that you foresee? You did speak a bit about them earlier, but can you state what are the more concrete, concretely what the challenges you would happen in a more, in a sort of a nightmare situation for you because we're living in a world where there's a lot of fast changing, uh, technology is changing really quickly, news is changing really quickly, mm -hmm. and also how the news is presented is changing really quick. What is, what kind of challenges do you foresee in the next few years? Oh boy. Um, Easy. There's a lot and I think par part of the reason why we, we've made such a focused effort with the GNI is because we, we see these challenges. They're very real. You all are experiencing them. Um, and we know that it's, we don't have an infant amount of time to solve some of these. I think on the business side, you know, um, the, these model, the, the advertising models that are not necessarily working for everyone are, are declining faster than the revenue, reader revenue models maybe are emerging. And so we know that there, again, it's not like we have five years to figure this out. This is the next couple of years we kind of need to, to, to figure that out and together. And so I feel like we do feel a sense of urgency on the, the reader revenue and business model side of things to accelerate our progress, be able to support, to, to the earlier gentleman's question, to be able to support more smaller local nor news organizations and not just make sure we're not tailoring our efforts to the large, uh, the large international players. Um, I think on the sort of elevating quality journalism set of you know, initiatives, misinformation continues to be, it's an evol a rapidly evolving challenge. You know, the, the, the people who are trying to purposefully mislead um, others are adapting their techniques um, there's new ways of deceiving people. Um, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, some of the dangers of, of um, things like deep fakes and how, how this is going to evolve. And I think we're, we're trying to look ahead and project, okay, what are the things that we should be worried about a few years from now so that we can get ahead of it, whether it's from a research standpoint to understand these challenges um, or actually building tools. So I think those are kind of two things that come to mind. But we know, again, we know that time is not infinite and there's a sense of urgency to all of these efforts. Time for one last question. Anyone want to claim that? Okay, I'll, I'll just make there's jo Joan. Just yeah. one more. Thank you. Um, Joan Donovan, Harvard Kennedy School, Shorenstein Center. Um, really interesting presentation. I have a million questions, but what I want to think about with you is um, the cross-platform question, especially around manipulation and disinformation. It's really tricky, and because Google does surface lots of information from lots of places that you can't vet or verify in the moment, how are you thinking differently about quality when it comes to um, new accounts that are on, like are you going to be working at all with Twitter, for instance, on looking at seasoned accounts or pages on Facebook where we know some of them, some news organizations are only on Facebook, right? So I'm trying to think about how you're going to cooperate or think cross-platform about this particular issue. It's a great question. Um, I think we need to do more of it. There certainly are conversations that happen on the product leadership side of things. We do regularly talk to our colleagues at, at Facebook and Twitter and other tech platforms. Um, you know, and I think in some of the, co the uh, collaborative uh, uh, sort of initiatives that I mentioned earlier, we actually work, are, are working with Facebook and Twitter on those. So they, they do come in. And so those have actually been a great opportunity for us to sort of say, we're, we, again, common good. We, we're all in this together and we want to um, identify this. In terms of like sharing information about specific accounts, um, I don't 
I have any specific knowledge of us of us doing that, but I, do, I generally agree with you that there needs to be more information sharing because this is a societal problem that we should be tackling together. So would love any, any specific thoughts you have too. We can chat afterwards. Thank you, and I think that's all we have time for. Just on your behalf, I'd like to say uh, thank you, Olivia. I look forward to the next 11 years. I don't know where we'll be then, but uh, <laughs> exactly. thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you very much.